Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to each one today. So good to see you here, and it is a beautiful fall day today, a lovely day. So how are you holding out this morning? Are you doing well? Yeah, worried? <laughs> you know, how is your hope doing these days? Well, understanding the order of things that will happen and the prophecies and the events before Jesus returns will give us hope in these trying days that we have. The Bible tells us about signs showing the nearness of the soon return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us what we need to do to be ready for that glorious day of his appearing. Now, in Matthew chapter 25, there is a remarkable parable. We're told about 10 virgins who were on their way to the wedding feast. This parable tells us that five of the 10 were saved and five were not ready and were lost. It's sad that some were not prepared and not ready to meet Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 introduces some key keys for survival so that we may be ready in the days that are before us. If we can learn this important lesson that Paul wants to give us here in this chapter of the Bible, we will certainly be among the survivors. But if we fail, well, let's just say we must not fail. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, this morning we ask for a heart of genuine love. Heavenly Father, for this great need, we come to you asking for your help. Help without which all our efforts will be like sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. We pray for a heart-melting love, a tender love, a forgiving love, and enduring love to, to live in us. Oh, Holy Spirit, work this awesome miracle of placing your beautiful love into our hearts just now. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 7. Well, actually, the whole chapter is very important to my message this morning. So if you have your Bibles or reading devices, maybe you would follow along. I'm going to start out here reading 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7 from the Message Bible. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't have love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day. And if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Then verses 3 to 7, if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't have love. I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Paul, in the, in the next verse, clearly defines for us what this love is that he's writing about. So listen to this. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for itself, than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. 
love doesn't strut, doesn't have a, a swollen head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Do we get it? Do we understand that this is a key that we must have in our lives? And what it is that will carry us through all things to the end. The key is love. He says love endures how much? All things. Now to understand better what this means. Let's continue with verses 13, or 8 through 13. This time I'd like to read it from the NLT version. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love lasts forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like Puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely. Just as God now knows me completely. And then Paul concludes with this, his main point. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And agape love. A godly love like this, in case you missed it, is a key to survival. If we have this love, if it is in our hearts, we can bear all things and endure all things and never fail. Believe it or not, someday we are going to be called upon to endure all things and to bear all things. Our faith will be tested. I, for one, hope for Jesus' sake that this awesome love is ours, that it is with us and in us before the final test of our faith in the last days. Now, the Bible is clear. You and I can know exactly what that test will be. As we study the Bible, we can know what questions will be asked. Now, if you're unsure of an answer, if you have thought, well, if they ask me that question, I know I'll fail, then you can be sure that question will come up. And how do I know that? Well, it's like this. There are two examiners in this examination. One is God, and the other, you guessed it, it's the devil. God is going to let Satan ask any questions he wants. He's going to let Satan test every one of us in the last days before Jesus returns. 
It is a time known in the Bible as the time of Jacob's trouble. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, or unsure of what that time is, let me explain. It's a time spoken of in Matthew 24, verse 21, just before Jesus returns. The Antichrist, we are told in Revelation chapter 13, will be empowered by Satan to have essentially free reign on the earth and will attempt to destroy the saved. God makes a sure and true promise, though. He will save those who are his, and his promise will be fulfilled when the Messiah returns to deliver his. Satan really is going to test us in every way in the last days, but there's nothing to be afraid of. And I, I want to encourage you today. Listen to this in 1 John 4, 17 and 18, our scripture for today from the NLT. And as we live in God, our power grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence. And because we live like Jesus here in this world, such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Well, may we experience this love today. You remember those words of Jesus? He said that in this last generation, men's hearts would be failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. What he's saying here is, if we look at all the negative and unpleasant and terrible things that they're looking at, then we will have great fear too, just like them. But on the other hand, if we look to Jesus and receive his love, then that perfect love will indeed cast out all fear. You and I don't have to be fearful, worried, or scared. This is what Jesus is telling us here. We will find rest and peace in God. From Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3 in the message, it says, God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. He, we stand fearless at the cliff edge of doom, courageous in sea storm and earthquake before the rush and roar of oceans, the tremors that shift mountains. Jacob wrestling God fights for us. The angel, the God of angel armies protects us. You know, Ellen White said, perfect peace is an attitude of heaven which angels possess oh my dear friends there's nothing that can frighten the children of god when our hearts are dedicated filled with love by knowing god then love joy and peace will fill the road ahead do you have that kind of love an agape love this morning, do you? If you say, yes, I'm sure of it, then believe me when I tell you that the great enemy has a, a committee of demons that's going to test that love. It may be tomorrow, it may be next week or next year, but it will happen. He's going to find out how much you can endure, and God will let him do it. To a point, he did with Job. Satan had to get God's permission for just how far he could go. And, and he allowed Satan to do anything to Job, except, of course, he didn't take his life. That testing will happen again. 
like it did with Job. And, and how did Job do, if you remember? His hope at times went out. His faith at times trembled. But in his love for God, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's Job 13, 15. And he also said, He knows the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job 23, 10. That, because of love's power, is to be the resolve of the remnant. Well, the greatest, greatest survivor in history is none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. His greatest test, his greatest battle was in Gethsemane and on the cross as he went through those, those dark, dark hours. I want to read something from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 210. It said, Faith and hope trembled in the expiring agonies of Christ. Think about that. But there was something that never trembled. It was his love. It was his love. Again, from that same page, from that same book, it said, Although he had the most fearful conflict with the powers of darkness, yet, yet, amid it all, his love grew stronger and stronger. You know, you can almost hear the devil that day that Jesus was on the cross. Uh, surely he must have said something like this to him. If you give your life for men, there's not many of them who are going to accept you anyway. And you'll go down in separation from your father. And you'll never, ever see his face again. Yes, for a time, faith and hope trembled. Jesus could not clearly see through the portals of the tomb. Even so, even at that, there was one thing that was clear. And it was that he loved you and me so much that if it meant eternal separation from his father, he would open heaven's gates for his children, even at the sacrifice of his life. Think of it. He loves you that much. Even if it meant that his death would close the gates for him eternally. Oh, friends, that is Jesus' wonderful love. We're going to need as much of that, of that love as our human hearts can hold. We will need it to go through the great crisis ahead. To endure the time of trouble that will soon begin and soon grow worse and worse, harder and harder, higher and and deeper and broader. And the Bible defines this as that time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. That's from Daniel 12.1. But love will keep us strong and take us through, dear friends. For love bears all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Do you have it today? Oh, that God may, may, may give an abundant supply to each one of us. Now, in Revelation 3.14, it says that Jesus is called the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. It is clear that because the remnant will face this tremendous ordeal, Jesus, the, the true witness, as Revelation 3.14 calls him, has sent an urgent message, a message to us. 
in this very chapter. This is the Savior's urgent Laodicean message. It's really a, a love letter from the heavenly bridegroom to his bride. Jesus yearns for the day when he and his bride, which is his church, can be fully and eternally united. He sends us this message from heaven, this letter of love to you and to me. I will read it from Revelation 3.18 from the NLT. He says, So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white raiments from me, so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. Now, do you know what the gold is? It's faith and love. Of those two, love is the most valuable. I counsel you, he pleads. In early writings, we're told about the time called the shaking. We'll look more into this in just a minute or so, but also the true witness, keep in mind, is Jesus. The Bible spells out a timeline of events for us. And I will give it to you in reverse order, and we'll go over this again. So in reverse order, Jacob's trouble comes before the coming of Jesus. And as the latter rain is before Jacob's trouble, so the shaking comes into play before the latter rain. That's in early writings, page 269 through 271, if you want to read that. Well, what is the latter rain? Again, from early writings, we see, we will see God's people with their countenance aglow with light and love when they have received the latter rain. They will be going out to give the loud cry and gather God's people from what the three angels of Revelation 14 calls Babylon. Gathering those that are not yet part of God's commandment, keeping refin, uh, uh, remnant, gathering them in. There will be a gathering in of all the true hearted believers before the final outpouring of the plagues. For sure, I believe God's people are going to be found worshiping in many of the different churches of the world. Up to that time of gathering. They will be called to join in with the remnant people of God. And they will answer that call. Praise the Lord. And that time I'll say again is called the, the latter rain. The loud cry coming during that short time of trouble. But again the shaking time comes even before the latter rain time comes. And what's the shaking time? Let's talk about that now for a minute. By definition, it is the falling away of those who will not accept God's message. First, I want you to notice uh, what it is that brings about the shaking. And I'm going to read it. It says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. Uh, by the way, this is from the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, the same reference that I just gave a minute ago. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. That's early writings, page 270. I forgot to give you that reference. So what causes the shaking? It's the straight Testimony. And what causes the straight testimony? The counsel of the true witness. The words of Jesus to the Laodiceans. 
Now, let me go over these events again because it, it can be a little bit confusing, I think, for if you've heard it for the first time. We have two causes and two effects. Again, from uh, page 270. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Again, what causes the shaking? The straight testimony. And what brings about the straight testimony? The counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This, the counsel of the true witness, will have its effect on the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. But sadly, this, the other side of the coin, if you will, some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will be the cause of a shaking amongst God's people. Asking you to study this for yourself. It's most important. Study it prayerfully. Dear friends, if receiving the counsel of the true witness, number one, will bring about the straight testimony, and if the straight testimony, number two, will bring about the shaking, and if the shaking, number three, will bring on the latter rain, and if the latter rain, number four, will give us power to give out the loud cry, which will finish the work and prepare us for translation, then don't you think we ought to be very interested in the counsel of the true witness, the counsel that starts the ball rolling here? This is so important to understand, my friend. These events Come in this order. Receiving the counsel of the true witness brings about the straight testimony. Giving the straight testimony causes the shaking. You following me so far? The shaking leads us on to the latter rain. And next, the latter rain, that is also called the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, gives power to give the loud cry to finish the work. And what happens next? The time of Jacob's trouble will come, and at the time, at that time, Jesus will come again in the clouds to redeem his own. Now, all around us, there are signs of the coming of the end. Yet, things have been held back for decades. The closing scenes that could have been here long ago. They're not here yet. Why not? It is because before Jesus comes, we must go through the Jacob's trouble time. If we go through it today, if that happened today, I'm sorry, but we'd all fail. I know I would, right? Before we can go through Jacob's trouble, we must, and I repeat, must have the latter rain. Well, why don't we have that? Because we're simply not ready for it. And what will prepare the church for the latter rain? The shaking will, brought about by the straight testimony, and that will bring about the Straight, and I'm sorry, what will bring about the straight testimony? You're ahead of me. You guessed it. The counsel of the true witness. Ah, this is the key, my friends. Receiving the counsel of the true witness will bring about the straight testimony. Dear friends, as you may know, we need to learn to wait for God's timeline in this. We must wait for the true latter rain, and we, we must wait for the true reformation. This doesn't mean that there's nothing for us to do. On the contrary, the waiting period has a purpose 
and God in heaven will wait until we've received the counsel of the true witness. Well, some, someone says, haven't we received that already? What is the counsel of the true witness? Remember, the counsel is for us to buy gold tried in the fire. The gold is faith and love. Now we come full circle. So do you have faith and love? How much? Do you have enough to, to go through? Here's the order of events again, real quickly. When, when we have the faith and love that Jesus is counseling us to buy, then we can and will give the straight testimony. After that can come the shaking. And after that can come the latter rain. After that can come the loud cry. And then can come the finished work. Finally, then can come Jacob's troubles and the last great battle and the appearing of Jesus in the clouds of heaven. Are you ready? So what do you say? Instead of being restless and wondering when God is going to do something, why not listen to his counsel and take it to heart? If we have it, we'll have a deep, earnest longing for the salvation of others. So in closing this morning, in Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand, where? At the door. And do what? Knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. Imagine Jesus standing at the door. Where should he be? He should be inside. But he's standing where? He's standing at the door knocking. Do you want him to come in? He wants to fill your heart with love. With a love that suffers long and is kind. It's not provoked. <laughs> Do you get provoked? Oh, some of you might say, I don't until somebody does something that I can't stand. <laughs> That's the whole point, amen? <laughs> Love bears all things, endures all things. I wonder, dear friends, if we should insist on going into the second grade before we pass the first grade. What do you say? I think we ought to be busy with our homework, our Heart work, getting this love. Many people are longing for power to change lives and save souls. But before gaining that power, we need love. Or else we wouldn't know what to do with that power. No, it was murmuring and complaining that started the problem in heaven some 6,000 years ago. There was nothing uh, to complain about, but Lucifer began to spread a virus of murmuring and fault finding. Now is the time to lay in a stock of gold, faith, love. What will you do as the Savior knocks? Let him in. Talk to God personally, individually. Open the door. Plead with him for that gold of love. Tell him you're sincere. And that you will surrender your heart to him. Then and only then... Will you be equipped to have a part in the finishing of the work that we are given to do? Amen.